I will confess something. First time that I heard about crabgrass as a forage, I was like, nah, that's a weed. Nobody's going to buy that. I remember when I started here back in July, Dr. David Lauman in animal science and Dr. Warren, our soil con conservation or no-till guy, was talking, hey, Alex, and about crabgrass? What do you think about crabgrass? And it didn't click. I said, no, I don't think that somebody would like to work with crabgrass as a forage. And we start to work with cover crops, try to fit cover crops with the wheat system and make some profit on those cover crops by grazing. And I start some research on that. And I have this picture to show from my cover crops. This is Kyle, my master student. This is 2016 Perkins. And this plot here is supposed to be mung beans. You can see some little flowers of the mung beans coming. But mainly, what we got there was crabgrass. And I run the forage analysis for this unpredicted mix that I get of crabgrass and mung beans. And the quality was high. It was pretty good. And so I revisited the idea of crabgrass as a forage. And I started to look around on other states, other fact sheets, publications. And I say, yeah. I may give a try on crabgrass. Looks like that might be a good alternative. So right now, that's how I like to talk about crabgrass. I love to hate, and I hate to love. Why I love to hate? Because crabgrass is a forage which can be high yielding, get a good quality. I, I would say not only good, but can be compared to alfalfa premium sometimes. It's palatable ice cream plant, and it's drought tolerant. Everything that we need for summer here in Oklahoma, something that's drought tolerant. But why I hate to love? Well, it's an annual weed that goes from spring to late summer, grows pretty aggressively on row crops that can be a nightmare. And it can reseed itself two up to three times in the same season. So that can be a major problem when you talk about row crops. But right now, I would like to focus on crabgrass as a forage. So crabgrass as a forage, as we mentioned, well, as a summer. That can start, summer annual, that can start growing, let's say, early spring. Soil temperatures reach around 58 Fahrenheit. Those seeds can start to germinate, so that can be early. And it spreads by runners, pretty much stolons, that are not above ground. They are up, close to the, in the surface. Different from Bermuda grass, it doesn't have the rhizomes underground where all the energy are stored. That's why the plant cannot survive through the winter. That's why this plant is an annual. The roots, what we have underground is just fine roots that doesn't have any reserves there at all. So it grows in a wide range of soils. I think that if you have a soil that you don't have acidity problems, that's higher than 5.8, 5.9, we're going to be good for growing crabgrass. But likes better well-drained soil. So it goes pretty well on sand soils, to be honest. And as I mentioned before, tolerates drought. Well, there is no miracle here. If we have less water, the crabgrass is going to produce less than in when you have good water, of course. But comparing to other forests, it can still keep some good growth. And it works well on mixes. Uh, visiting some fact sheets and publications from other states, uh, mixing with fescue can be a good way to balance the amount of forage that we're going to have, because fescue has more production, let's say, spring and after fall. So during the summer, where fescue start to decrease growth, the crabgrass come up and fill that gap during the summer. And also can be a complementary forage with small grains. That's what becomes very interesting here on thinking on put the crabgrass right after eat wheat. Uh, if you are thinking about 
a grazing out system where we can prolong the, the window for, for grazing. Now, let's talk a little bit on the basics. If I, you really buy the idea and you want to grow some crabgrass, so how you can establish that? I would say not much different when we are doing uh, Bermuda grass by seeding or even alfalfa. So the basics here. So you do some soil sampling to know the status of the fertility of your soil and also how the pH is. And of course, you do a good weed control. And you're going to put phosphorus, potassium, and liming according to the need. pH for crabgrass, 5.7 to 7. If you have a pH around 5.8, 5.9 is going to be OK. But I'm going to tell something. Go there and apply some lime. Because in two, three years, you may have a pH problem there. And it's an annual that you need to seed. But the crabgrass can reseed itself. So if you seed it one time and you let that plant produce seed, you don't need to reseed next year. But if you are incorporating lime in the second, third year, you are putting that six inches and turning the soil, those seeds are going to be down deep and they are not going to sprout. So that's why it would be interesting to put the lime in the first year and put your pH around 6.3, 6.5, a little higher. So you incorporate PK and lime. And right now, I would say nitrogen would be not a good idea. Uh, nitrogen is a very dynamic uh, nutrient. So what happens is, if it's in the soil, can volatilize, the nephri can leach, and all that stuff. So better that you put the nitrogen when the roots are uptaking the, this nitrogen. So wait the crabgrass to develop some roots, and so you can put the nitrogen. Now, time for seeding. Let's say mid-April to mid-June. The main point here is the two inches top of the soil should be with a temperature of 58 Fahrenheit. At 58 is not all the crabgrass seeds that's going to start to come up. Uh, majority of the seeds start to, to sprout when we have about 62, 65, but some start at 58. So what you need to do is pretty much, if you are used to do alfalfa or Bermuda grass seeding, is the same deal. You need to have a very firm seed bed where when you step with your boot, what you are going to get there is nothing deeper than half an inch. If that goes deeper, like one inch or more, it's too soft. You need to go there and compact a little more. Crab grasses, Bermuda grasses, alfalfa is a very tiny seed. If you put too deep, that seed is not going to make it to the surface. So you want to have the seedlings. Seeding rate, what I'm showing here is pretty much the rule of thumb. Three to five pounds of pure life seed per acre. Now, I would recommend, see exactly when you have your seed bag, the recommendations from where you buy. They have better information for that specific variety. How to plant uh, in variety trial that I had in Chickasha this year, and I'm going to show some data in the end. I just used a brilliant, a small seed drill, and that did the work pretty well. Calibrated for Bermuda. That's it. Now, if you don't have a small seed drill, you can broadcast, and after do a light airing, and then just pass a roller or some to compact in order for you to have a good soil seed contact. Now, what you can do also after that you broadcast is just drag some chains, swirl that soil with the seed. That will work also. Keep that at one quarter inch and pass a kind of a roller to compact. That soil seed contact is very important. Now, something that's a little tricky here. Crabgrass is a very light seed. So it's good that you put a carrier, or let's say, when you are applying our phosphorus and potassium, or any other thing that you can use as a carrier, would be good to mix with the crabgrass, and so you spread for we have a better distribution. But 
According to what I was reading, and this is pretty much more uh, a practical way to say that is when it's spreading, uh, broadcasting the crabgrass, make sure that when you are driving your tractor, you are doing track to track because the, the crabgrass seeds won't go further than behind your truck. So if we start to go and see the fertilizer, the carry going wider, the crabgrass seed, even though with that, was not going to reach that wide. So try to keep track to track. And of course, you may need to calibrate that for that small range that you are working. Now, fertilization, I mentioned P and K, liming, now let's focus a little bit on nitrogen. This is pretty much what we have for Oklahoma. As you can see, we have a high yield goal east, eastern portion of the state, of course, that's pretty much related to precipitation. And as we move to the west, we may have less production due to precipitation, of course. So the rule of thumb here is for every ton per acre that you want to produce, apply 50 pounds of actual nitrogen. That would be around 110 pounds of urea, right? Now, there is a catch here. This is a graph from research uh, that was developed in Kansas. And actually, th this paper here uh, incorporates different uh, crabgrass fields from different years and locations in the, in the Southern Great Plains, in the Great Plains. And they show that most likely that crabgrass will have a response to fertilization up to 100 pounds per acre when you talk about yield, okay? So 100 pounds per acre, you are maximizing yield. Well, there are some specific research that I visit. When you have a very sand soil, very low nitrogen, you can have some, perhaps some response if you go 150 pounds per acre. But most likely that you will not gonna have. When you talk about responding to yield, if we split the application, looks like that the total yield that you are going to be doing during this season may not change. But what I'm talking here is just about yield. And who works with forage? No. Yield is just a half of the story. Quality is the other half, right? Quality is very important. And look what happened with the crude protein when you still keep increasing your nitrogen rate. Your crude protein continue increasing even though you don't have a response to yield. And that's very important. So sometimes you're harvesting and you might not see a response for a higher nitrogen application. But the quality is going to be higher, so your hay is going to sell in a higher price or your animals is going to have a higher gain, right? Because in the end, that's what really matters. Now, there are another way that also you can improve your quality, is splitting the application. Even though yield, total yield in the season is not going to change, if we split the application, you are not going to have any penalty in the first cut, but in the second cut, you can have a slightly higher quality. So it's still important to split the nitrogen application. What I'm going very detailed here, because sometimes people focus pretty much on the tonnage. Well, I applied this on nitrogen and I didn't see a response on how much I'm producing here, so it doesn't work. But sometimes you need to look at your quality also. And this is pretty much table from that study. And I don't want to take too long here, but this is the crude protein content in the crabgrass hay. You can see that when you have low rates, the crude protein is pretty low, is eight. And as you increase the nitrogen application, our crude protein also will increase. Of course, we need less soybean meal. We are going to have a dry, a higher intake, or as fed cost also decreases, feed efficiency increase, if increases. That means that your animal is going to have more gain. But if you want to look pretty much in dollars, you can see exactly here on the value of the hay. You can see that the crude protein of eight 
My God, I just realized I start to shake a lot. Okay, so it's 71.60 per ton. That's amount, the amount of, that's the dollars that we were gonna pay for the tonnage when you have a 8% crude protein hay. Now look what happened when you have like 2.5% higher, 10.5, it goes to 79. So that translates that for every 1% of crude protein that we increase in our hay, you are adding about $3.25 as profit for that same tonnage. Now, is that good enough? Well, according to them, back in 2015, when this is, no, 2005, sorry, when that was published, in the five year average from 2001 to 2005, that would pay off and you're gonna have a higher profit if you put more nitrogen to have that increase in crude protein. Nowadays, well, we need to run the numbers and see what changed on urea costs and also how much they are paying for the hay. But I, what I wanna mention here is that sometimes invest a little more in fertilization to increase the quality, not only the, the tonnage, may pay off. Now let's move and talk about the grazing crabgrass. It's a very palatable, consider a ice cream plant, so as soon as you introduce the cattle there, the cattle is gonna go for the crabgrass. So don't introduce when the crabgrass is, is still growing and it's too early because the cattle is gonna take that over and you're not gonna have more production. So that's what we say, introduce cattle. The earliest that we can do is when the crabgrass is six, six inches. And I would say you're gonna introduce that early if you don't have any other source of fodder available and you need that at the moment. Now, if you wanna take the most from your crabgrass, I would say wait about 12 inches. That's pretty much when the crabgrass is start to elongate and is finishing his vegetative, its vegetative state and going to reproductive stage. That's pretty much the best time. And you're gonna graze down to three inches. And in my opinion, three inches is even critical. Because remember what I told comparing to Bermuda grass. It doesn't have any reserves below ground. So the reserve that crabgrass rely to regrowth is gonna be in the stems that you leave, some energy there, and it needs some leaves there to catch up with photosynthesis so it can regrow fast. So I would say even graze down to four, five, but you, though you don't need to leave more than six inches and you need to see some green leaves there. So in this case, you're gonna have a good regrowth. Crabgrass due to that goes pretty well in a rotational system. If you try to graze continuously, it may not be as productive as when you are doing rotation. Now, something very important, if you want a crabgrass coming next year, you need to let the crabgrass produce seed. So when planning your rotational system, Make sure that every pasture that you have, at least once from June to August, will produce seed. And I will show some quality data. The quality when it's, still, when it's with seed is still good and comparable to Bermuda grass at four weeks. So it has good quality crabgrass for being a grass, not a legume. And something important to hear is graze out terminate your crabgrass before killing frost. Because after the killing frost, it becomes unpalatable. The cattle will not touch it. So stocking piling crabgrass is not good. The cattle is not gonna eat that after that's completely dead. Now let's talk about crabgrass hay. I didn't talk about the average yield. According to the literature, we can say that the average yield for crabgrass would be four tons per acre, 8,000 pounds per acre, but <laughs> it can range from one to five, trust me, it can. So that depends pretty much, as you can guess, on fertility, rainfall, and also the time that you plant and the variety that you are working with it. 
for hay, differently from grazing, you want to maximize the amount that we are cutting, right? So we can have, have a good tonnage for a cut. So we don't need to cut two or three, four times, but you have this, just two cuts, so we're saving labor and in gas. But at the same time, we need to think about our quality. So a good time to cut would be from boot. That's pretty much when you see that the head's about to come out from the stem to the head stage. That would be the best time to cut. And leave a stubble height from three to six inches. I know, and this is a big problem, producers tell, Alex, you tell me to leave a higher stubble height, but my cutter doesn't go higher than three inches, or sometimes even don't go three inches high. And also, the cutter will bump, and sometimes I will scalp my field. I know that that's a problem, but try your best, because that little leaves that you leave there and stays will pay off on, on regrowth. Now, this is pretty much quality of crabgrass. You can see that if you cut about four or five weeks, look, we are having a crude protein of 20% and a TDN of 64. I would say this is comparable to alfalfa, right? RPV 150. I mean, that's very good quality. This would be good for lactating cows. So, and this is pretty much the time that we are cutting Bermuda grass, and Bermuda grass is going to have what? 17%, 16% crude protein. So you can see that we can have higher quality when comparing to Bermuda grass and other grasses that we grow during the summer. And you can achieve that pretty much June, July. That's pretty much the time that the alfalfa is not growing well and other forages are not being very productive. Now, if you wait a little more, six, seven weeks, for we have more tonnage, you can see that you can have same quality as Bermuda grass cut for at four weeks. If you extend for seven weeks, and you can have a higher tonnage and keep the same quality as Bermuda grass. So that's a plus of crab grass when comparing with other grasses. Now, so far, what I show, oh. I forgot to mention something very interesting that I, I, I read and I think that it was very smart. It's a nice catch. Everybody knows, as I mentioned, it's going to be the third time. If you want the crabgrass come up next year without the receding, let the plant produce seeds, right? Well, when you're grazing, there's not that you can do. You need to let the cattle out on that, on that paddock or sub-pasture if you're rotating until you get the seed. But when you are cutting for hay, what you can do is you can cut before we have the seeds for higher quality. But what you do is you just leave some gaps in the field. So you pass your cutter here and you leave a gap of one, two feet and cut it here. Those plants, you let them produce seed and they will receive the rest of the field. That looks like to be a good practice if you want a hay cut for hay, get good quality before seeding, and at the same time still produce seed for the next year. So moving on now, that it's pretty much what I'm trying to do here is summarize a fact sheet that Jason Warren, Lauma, Lauman, and I also contribute in that fact sheet just put out now. Uh, this is based on demonstration plot that we have around Stillwater here. That start five years ago, even I was not here when that starts, uh, where they try to fit the crabgrass after the wheat in a grazing out system. And after five years, we learned some lessons. We still have lots to learn, but there are some, some things that we can talk if somebody's trying to fit crabgrass with wheat. So, of course, if you are trying to graze out wheat, we are going to uh, plant the wheat earlier, right? Let's say early September, mid-September, right? So you're going to let it grow. And luckily, by mid, late October, we can start grazing. And so comes the winter. And so it start, comes the spring and start to warm up. And that's the time here that you might be thinking on top dressing and putting some nitrogen on your wheat, right, when comes the spring. 
At that moment, if you want a crabgrass, what you can do is just mix the crabgrass with your urea and apply the crabgrass with your nitrogen right there. You just apply right there. Of course, we have the wheat growing, so we cannot incorporate that seed, dust that seed to stay one quarter inch. But you are in a grazing system here, so the cattle will be stepping there. And when the cattle is stepping, it's going to be incorporating those seeds in the one quarter inch. Now, if it start to rain, and the soil, and when the cattle steps, the soil start to go too down, it's better that you take the cattle out, otherwise that seed is going to go too deep, and the crabgrass is not going to come out. But the, the cattle can do the work of the, the herring and also the compact in the roller for us. So you can just place your seed right here. And when come, let's say, end of April, you need to start to think about some things. What is more important now? That you let the wheat growing because you need more forage in the next days, or you have where to put your cattle right now in another location, and you can think about having forage, um, forage from crabgrass more earlier during the summer. So you may think about that because right here, the crabgrass is going to start to germinate. If you let the wheat tall and the cattle grazing, what happens is the crabgrass is going to grow slow because there is not much sunlight down there. Now, if you want to terminate your wheat, your crabgrass, as soon as the, the light hits them, it's going to grow aggressively. And you are going to, in one month, get that completely covered by crabgrass. So that's something that you need to think right here. And so you scout your field and you start to see when the crabgrass seedlings start to come. And that moment you make the decision. If you decide to terminate your wheat, you graze out, you can cut for hay pretty short. And cutting for hay is the best because it's pretty even. So your crabgrass stand is going to come pretty much even through the field. And then, let's say, you may have crabgrass early June or even earlier if you do that. And so you're going to graze the crabgrass according to the way that I, I mentioned before. And here is the catch. The crabgrass can grow to the first killing frost. Well, but there is something. After August, it's still growing, but it starts to grow pretty slow. We won't have much production from crabgrass from August forward. So first of all, don't try to place any fertilizer on crabgrass in August. It's not going to pay off. So what we found out after these five years is that the best to do you know, when you are, you are trying to match with wheat is terminate your crabgrass by grazing out in the first week of August. Because everybody knows Oklahoma has kind of an erratic rainfall pattern during the summer. And it's good that we leave 30 to 45 days where we are going to have the crabgrass dead with a 100% cover. doesn't matter how much uh, residue you leave there. Don't focus on how much residue you leave on tonnage, but on having a good cover through the field to protect soil evaporation. And so the water will come and recharge for you plant the wheat next. Because the problem sometimes with cover crops or anything that you put it during the summer and after you want to put the wheat is that sometimes you use all the water that was there and the wheat needs to rely on the two days water. In other words, there is no water in the soil for the wheat. So if the rain doesn't come, your wheat may fail. So that's the little catch here when you talk about managing in a graze out wheat system. There is much more to learn, but so far that's what we figured out that would be some tips on managing that. 
Now, I would like to move to the last portion of this presentation that talk about crabgrass varieties. Um, of course, we have what people just call native crabgrass, that crabgrass is from Africa, it's not native, but I understand what they're trying to say, the ones that pretty much grow for weed, and sometimes people just let them grow, and you can have a good grazing. But there are varieties that were developed exactly for forage production. The oldest one comes, was developed a half century ago at Noble Foundation and is named the Red River. It's pretty much for grazing. It grows comparing to other forests very aggressively, but comparing to the other crabgrasses has a kind of a slower growth pattern. That's pretty much what you want when you're grazing, right? You want that the growth of that forage pretty much matches how much the, the cattle is taking every day. So you always you have that kind of lush material at the top. But the Red River was developed 50 years ago about that. And companies are replicating this material for years and years and years and years. And they are not hybrids. They are a population of plants that has a kind of a genetic pool difference among it each individual. So after crossing them, the Red River variety start to lose a little bit its original characteristics. So what they did, they come with the Dolls Red River. That's pretty much trying to bring back that Red River back 50 years ago. That's pretty much what the Dolls Red River, sometimes they call Big River, is about. And we have newer ones. We have the quick and big and the quick and big spreader. Well, I think that the names are red says, right? Grows quick and big. That's pretty much what that crabgrass does. And they were developed more for hay because when you are producing hay, what do you want? That that grows fast and a lot, so you cut. So that was developed more for hay. But that was the problem here. When they developed the quick and big, they increased the upright growth but the plant lost some of the stolons, the runners growing. So what happened is when they cut for hay, the regrowth would be uh, not that good because you don't have too much leafy material staying there. So that's why they come with the quick and big spreader because this one produces the same amount of upright growth, but at the same time produce more stolons more horizontal stems, so we have more leaf material there for help the regrowth. So that's pretty much the difference among those varieties. Now, shame on me. I planted them uh, in Chickasha last year. It's not my fault, okay? I planted a little late. That was May 8th. But that's because the, the seeds reached us on May 5. There are Rimpel, the guy that sent the, the seeds to us, uh, he could not get the seed earlier, so we need to plant pretty late. So that's what we got on the first cut. There was about June 29. You can see that quick and big spreader uh, produces the highest, 2,500 pounds per acre. The lowest was Red River, 1,800. And then on October 27, yeah, I know, it looks like, wow, that went to October. I'm going to explain why. And that will help us to understand more how crabgrass works. And sometimes, you know, something terrible like that, we can take good lessons from it. You can see that we have very low production. I would say half ton per acre, 1,251 on big, quick and big spreader. And Red River, we have 1,000, half a ton. Uh, as you can see, the total, we didn't hit two tons per acre total. We didn't hit that. So we didn't have a good production at all. But look at the quality. And I cut pretty much seven, eight weeks after planting. Because what I want is exactly produce seed. Because I want to see how much of those plants are going to regrow next year. And look at the crude protein. After that, the plant put the seed out. The quick and big spreader and quick and big was about 15, 13% crude protein. And look at the Red River and the Dolls Red River. It was slightly higher. Why? Well, there is always a trade. If you have more tonnage production, you're going to have lower quality. 
the quick and bigger, they are quick. So when I cut, they were in a mature stage that was more advanced. That means those plants were older and had more lignin. They had the higher tonnage, but they have lower quality. And something that we did after that we cut and we saw some regrowth was go there and do the species composition. See how much is really crabgrass and how much would be other weeds, right? And you can see that the Red River, 23% was weeds. We have pig weeds there, stinky grass and other coming. And after the other ones were slightly, was much lower. But even though the Red River was, compared to the others, high, keep in mind that the threshold for a start bothering on weed control in a pasture is 30% weeds, right? So none of them would be a matter of controlling any weeds there. Now, why my crabgrass didn't go pretty well? Well, as I told, we plant a little late, but rain came, and so we did the first cut. And look what happened after the first cut. No rain for a month, and that was summer, hot. Crabgrass can be drought tolerant, but there's no miracle. You have a three inches of stubble there, no water coming, no much reserves. Those plants die, but we, pr we produce it seeds, right? So what happened is when the rain comes back in August and we get about three inches, we start to see some crabgrass, but not coming from the stubbles, but coming from seed. And then from here, took about more eight weeks for we start to see seeds again, because again, I wanted to produce seeds. And why it take longer? Remember, here is August. From August forward, crabgrass will grow, but it's gonna grow much slower, right? So that's why it took too long. Second cut was not a second cut from the same plants. Actually, was plants coming new seeds. That's why. But that showed to us something here. And when everything goes wrong, we still can have forage production there with a good quality, with crabgrass. With, other, with some cover crops or even other annual legumes or grasses, no, we, won't, we will have sometimes a complete failure. So that shows how crabgrass can be resilient, even in a condition like that. So that's pretty much what I'd like to talk today on crabgrass. Thank you.